And one of its most enthusiastic members was a young woman, Lizzie Mack. But before we go any further, I want to say a big thank you to today's video sponsor, Morning Brew. Over the past year or so, I've been trying to cut down on the amount of time that I spend aimlessly scrolling through social media. I've been particularly keen to wean myself off my Twitter habit for various quite guessable reasons. There's just one problem. Over the past half decade or so, Twitter and social media more generally when was this have been made? at the bulk of my news. Luckily, a little while back, all right, I just yeah, all right, fine. It's fine to call Twitter. Is a free daily newsletter that provides a succinct and fun summary of each day's headlines. It aims to get you up to speed with everything that's going on in the world of politics, business, and tech in just five minutes. And like I said, it's fun. The writers of Morning Brew seem to really understand that sometimes a witty little joke is exactly what's needed to make the important parts of a story stick in the brain. One thing that Morning Brew has really helped me to do is to keep much better tabs on the stock market and business news. I've not traditionally been someone who pays too much attention to what the S&P 500 is doing, how much a barrel of oil costs, or what the US federal rate of interest is. But particularly in times of economic uncertainty, such as those we're currently experiencing, keeping an eye on what's going on in Wall Street can actually really help to explain lots of the other things that are going on elsewhere in the economy. Morning Brew not only makes that information easily accessible to me by sending it straight to my inbox, but also takes the time to explain what some of those numbers and other stats mean. So if you want to join me in starting your mornings off informed, then you can sign up to Morning Brew for absolutely free at morningbrewdaily.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. That link again is morningbrewdaily.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you so much once again to Morning Brew for sponsoring this video, which we will return to right now. Okay, so back to Lizzie Maggie. Lizzie Maggie received a copy of Progress and Poverty as a gift from her dad not long after its publication. She had thanks really? dad a 400 page economics textbook. And in one way yeah. or another, Lizzie would dedicate the rest of her life to the single tax movement. She was the secretary of her local branch of the Women's Single Tax Club. She spoke at conferences. She taught evening classes in Georgist economics. The biggest testament to Maggie's enthusiasm and intellect, however, was the manner in which she distilled the many complexities of Henry George's theories into a simple to understand, fun to play board game called the landlords. This was a pretty ingenious move on Maggie's part. See, the turn of the 20th century saw a boom in sales of commercial board games among the American middle class. On the one hand, new printing technologies were making such games easier to manufacture and cheaper to buy. On the other, the adoption of electric lighting essentially extended people's available leisure time. People were clamouring for new games to play, so why not use the opportunity to teach them about how landlords suck? In 1902, Lizzie Maggie wrote this letter to the Single Tax Review, the newsletter of her beloved moon. She outlines the basic concept for the landlord's game, which would, she declared, provide a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all its usual outcomes and consequences. A year later, she patented her invention, including in her application an illustration of this game. I agreed with everything so far until she which, said she patented it. No doubt, it. looks pretty familiar. The board for the landlord's game includes plots of lands to buy, water and electricity squares, tax and luxury oh. squares, a neutral public park corner, a jail corner, a go to jail corner, and a final corner square and receives $100 in wages for passing. The landlord's game wasn't exactly the same as modern-day Monopoly. Shit, Anyone that's who's a played a multi-hour game of the latter will be relieved to know that Maggie's creation had a set length of five circuits, after which the wealthiest player won. Further, it contained references to an unseen landowning villain called Lord Bluebeard, who, to add to his crime, was also British, as well as squares for absolute necessities such as bread Why and shit. Why do love giving me it money? So it briefly raises questions among players about landlordism and inequality. 
Nevertheless, given the tale of treachery and fraud which is to follow, it's worth noting how much this line drawing from 1903 does share with Hasbro's contemporary title. You see, Lizzie Maggie may have had her critics of capitalism, yeah. but that didn't stop her from self-publishing a commercial version of the Landlord's Game with help from some fellow Henry George fans in 1906. And... Presumably it sold some copies, but it certainly wasn't a runaway success. Maggie uh, continued to tinker to and refine the game, but she remained reliant on her work as a yeah, typist what are you do about and it? a journalist to pay the bill. Ow. So, are the similarities between this game and this game pure coincidence? Well, no. Obviously not. Could you imagine? But the road from one to the other was full of twists and turns. Lizzie Maggie's commercial version of the Landlord's Game may have been a bit of a dump. I imagine it was a bit like anyone who's ever been in a band that put out an album where she just had a room full of unsold copies of this thing. But remember, she didn't create it in order to get rich and famous. The game's primary purpose was to be a teaching tool. The game was designed so that each time a player landed yeah, when you on make a square home by another, teaching, you're was forced to pay them rent, it would spark a conversation about the morality of an economic system in which lazy landlords get rich off the back of the world. When will people clubs. understand this? Support for the single tax movement had already started to wane after Henry George's death in 1897. The likelihood that the United States might replace all taxes with a land value tax got slimmer and slimmer. Nevertheless, Maggie and others kept the faith. Unfazed by its commercial failure, Maggie continued to teach the landlord's game to her comrades, and it quickly became a significant part of single tax subculture. In fact, plenty of Georgists began to play it just for fun. One such group was the residents of the village of Ard in Delaware. Arden was established in 1900 as a model community in which Henry George's principles could be put into practice. To this day, all land within Arden is municipally owned and leased to residents, meaning that the benefits of any increase in the value of land within the village are retained for the community as a whole. It's unclear whether or not Lizzie Maggie actually visited Arden herself. Whoever first introduced it to the village, however, the landlord's game swiftly became a staple feature of Arden life. What's notable here is that the copies of the game being played in Arden were not the slick, commercially produced sets that Maggie had published in 1906. Instead, players made their own sets, featuring cloth boards and handmade cards. One outcome of this was that as the game spread through the community and new residents made new sets, they were able to iterate on the game's rules. For instance, players added some additional characters to their rules by naming the different plots of land. Cheaper plots were given spoof names like Rubeville, Rickety Row, with more expensive plots being named after well-known wealth centres such as Fifth Avenue and Wall Street. Players in Arden also started to group the plots of land into sets of two and three. The flip side of the game spreading from player to player in this way was that, with each new link in that chain, the connection to Lizzie Maggie became weaker. Players increasingly thought of the landlord's game as a kind of folk game, like chess, without an inventor as such at all. Many didn't even call it the landlord's game. Some called it the anti landlord Others, business, and others still, the Monopoly game, or simply, Monopoly. Had she known at the time how far her game was spreading, Lizzie Maggie perhaps wouldn't have minded not getting credit for inventing it. By the 1920s, the Monopoly game was being played across the northeastern United States. It was particularly popular in universities, where professors at institutions including Columbia and the Wharton School of Finance used it to infuse students about concepts such as monopolies, market power, and antitrust laws. Maggie might even have appreciated some of the further additions that players were making to the game. 
Students of Williams College in Massachusetts, for example, added rules by which one could purchase little wooden houses to increase the rent that was due should another player land on one of your properties. Maggie might have been disappointed that these play sessions didn't necessarily end with an endorsement of a land value tax or her boy Henry George. Nevertheless, the game was still inviting discussions about how much landlords suck, so, you know, halfway there. If this is where our story ended, then this might be a pretty drama-free tale. In fact, there's a real purity and wonder to the notion of this game being passed from person to person entirely through word of mouth. Had Lizzie Maggie's commercial version of the Landlord's Game been a success, then that version of the game would have been fine. But its failure opened the door for the game to experience a kind of analogue open source development process, with each new set of players making their own tweaks and refinements. It almost makes one question our current regime of stringent intellectual property laws, which give the originator of an idea a, well, monopoly on it. Unfortunately, after three decades of glorious experiment in collective board game design, someone had to come along and ruin it all. So, by the 1930s, the Monopoly game was being played far and wide. But in order to tell the story of how it got stolen, we only need to travel around an hour's drive from Arden to the coast. This is That's Atlantic City. Atlantic City had begun to be developed as a resort town in you the know, 1850s. Since I, I should and just focus on the early my 1900s, energy it was a booming and resources to destination. Atlantic to City had a reputation as a city of vice. Its key industries were gambling, prostitution, and, during the Prohibition, booze. What might surprise you then is that many of its grandest hotels were run by Quakers. Now, I don't know how much people know about Quakers outside of them being the porridge people, but you know the Jesus was a socialist to mean? Well, what? the Quakers, or Society of Friends as they're officially called, have more or less turned that into a whole denomination. Quakers are committed pacifists and, in theory at least, try to live their faith through fighting injustice and inequality. In fact, if you go to a meeting of any vaguely left-wing political group in the UK, there's a 50-50 chance it will take place in a Quaker meeting house. It was likely this animosity towards social injustice that led the Quakers of Atlantic City to become so hooked by the Monopoly game. The game reportedly made its way to Atlantic City from Arden via Indianapolis, which is quite the round trip. During this journey, the game had continued to evolve. The starting corner on Lizzie Maggie's board had referenced Henry George's belief that economic value is a product of natural Don't resources outside, plus guess. human labour. Now, it just read go. The Quakers of Atlantic City would have their own amendments. A corner square which had once been a public park became free parking. Which feels like the opening of a noxious bikes video. Just like countless players before them, they also renamed the property spaces on the board after What's the city in which they lived. You can make armor Little out did of they coal? know that those streets were right an avenue in brown due to boardwalk blue would soon become the de facto property names for the Monopoly game across the United States. And that's all because of this slippery little snake, Charles Dow. Charles Darrow was a saint who lived in Philadelphia. In the late summer of 1932, Charles was invited round for dinner at a friend's house. His friends, Charles and Olive Todd, had just returned from visiting family in Atlantic City, where they'd been taught how to play the Monopoly game. The Todds, in turn, taught Charles. And little did they know that that lesson would change everything. See, Darrow wasn't a particularly successful salesman. The Great Depression wasn't, as its name might suggest, a oh. great time for most people, which made it harder and harder to sell most. Further, Darrow had a young son who needed expensive medical. 
to offer him a little bit I, of sympathy. I don't need to cook anything. The Darrows were about as rough as they can get for any. Mm. In the Monopoly game, however, since I'm curious though, I may as well try the help cooking a stack and see what that will get me. F.O. Alexander. Together, Darrow and Alexander would play game after game of Monopoly, with Alexander periodically adding distinctive illustrations and lettering to their shared form. The go the free party, the train sim. All of these features of modern day Monopoly are derivatives of Alexander's sketches from 1933. Once he was satisfied with these designs, Darrow had 500 copies of the game commercially printed and set about trying to sell them. Which, it's interesting how these stories about Darrow and another businessman who started from nothing always involve them having enough money lying around to, like, start the business. It's worth emphasizing that the only aspect which distinguished Darrow's version of Monopoly from the countless handmade versions being played in homes across the northeastern United States were the design elements, a contribution for which F.O. Alexander would never receive a single penny. The only personal innovation of Darrow's had been to experiment with making the Monopoly board circular, but that got scrapped by the time he actually released the game, so... After a short time walking the game himself, Darrow got the letter that he had been hoping for. The wife of Parker Brothers president, Robert Barton, had seen the game being sold in F.A.M. Schwartz, and suggested to her husband that Parker Brothers might acquire it. Barton agreed, and in March 1935, Parker Brothers signed an agreement with Charles Darrow to purchase the rights to Monopoly. A shrewd businessman, however, Robert Barton knew that it wouldn't be enough to sell a slightly shinier version of an otherwise semi-popular folk game. He needed to crush any and all competition and claim Monopoly as his own. Now, Charles Darrow wasn't the first person to produce a commercial I can be smart. Monopoly. Obviously, there was Lizzy Maggie's Landlord's Game, which he produced a second, modified version of in 1924. But in the mid-1930s, one could also find finance, easy money, and inflation on the shelves too. What made Darrow and Parker Brothers' effort different was the lengths that they went to in order to crush their competition and establish their version of Monopoly as the only one of its kind. Parker Brothers had a history of being very ruthless when it came to intellectual property. In the 1890s, the company had tried to claim ownership over Tiddlywinks. That's right, they wanted exclusive rights over the concept of flipping little discs into a cup. A decade later, they trademarked the words ping pong and fought to establish their own proprietary version of the sport as the only legitimate version of table Why? Wow, it's an Olympic sport! Ended in disappointment for the company. With this in mind, Parker Brothers encouraged Darren to compose an elaborate creation for Monopoly. You The story he came up with placed himself as the game's sole inventor, without reference even to his mate F.O. Alexander. Darren wrote that, being unemployed at the time, and badly needing anything to occupy my time, I made by hand a very crude game for the sole purpose of amusing myself. Then, with help from Barker Brothers, he applied for a patent for the game. By rights, Darrow and Parker Brothers' patent application should have been thrown out of sight. As I discuss in my video about vaccine patents, an invention is only patentable if it is completely original. Darrow's version of Monopoly clearly infringed upon two separate patents awarded to Lizzie Maggie. And even if Maggie hadn't applied for those patents, the game was being played far and wide. By the same metric, neither Darrow nor Parker should have been able to trademark the word Monopoly. As enthusiasts have been referring to their own handmade versions of the game as Monopoly for decades. Nevertheless, for whatever reason, both patent and trademark were awarded. Over the coming years, Parker Brothers used this patent to remove all other Monopoly-style games from the market. They furthered their cause.
Wars by making Charles Darrow's made-up invention story central to the game's marketing. The Great Depression was still in full swing, and the story of a down-on-his-luck salesman who invented himself out of poverty was no doubt an inspiring one to many. There was just one more stop to make. In 1935, George Parker, the founder of Parker Brothers, travelled to Arlington, Virginia, where Lizzie Maggie now lived with her husband, Albert. When Parker told Maggie that he wanted to purchase the patent to Monopoly, she must have been over the moon. In reality, Parker wanted to ensure that she wouldn't be able to challenge his company's ownership of the game. Maggie, however, wondered whether this meeting might be the first step in using it to revitalize interest in Henry George and the land value tax. Lizzie Maggie sold the patent to the landlord's game to Parker Brothers for a flat $500. Bruh. And with that, Parker Brothers had established a monopoly on Monopoly. The Parker Brothers version of the game went on sale late in 1935 and was an instant hit. For while Monopoly style games have been a widespread phenomenon prior to 1935, the player base had still been relatively niche. Much like the Georgist economic principles which had inspired the game, Monopoly likely seemed a little too nerdy for most players. The Parker Brothers marketing machine, however, reframed the game as aspiration. Landlords were no longer the villains of the game. In fact, bankrupting your friends and family was a virtuous thing to do. With this reframing, Monopoly quickly captured the American imagination. In its first year on the market, the game sold a quarter of a million copies. The next year, it sold 1,751,000. Monopoly brought in millions of dollars in pure profit for Parker Brothers in that year alone, and that's in 1935 money. Through wars, political crises, economic booms, and market busts, Monopoly sales have remained strong ever since. Under Parker Brothers' stewardship, the game quickly spread across the globe. The company first licensed the game to a manufacturer in the UK, but further international editions soon followed in France, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and pretty much everywhere else. With rare exceptions, each new edition of the game replaced the Atlantic City streets of the US version with those of a city within that country. The production of non-city themed versions of Monopoly is a much more recent phenomenon. In 1991, Parker Brothers was acquired by Hasbro. Or more precisely, Parker Kent, which was an amalgamation of Parker Brothers and Kent Toys, both of which previously been bought up by Jeff Mills, which was closely on the stock exchange, purchased and taken private by Tonga, who was then itself went bankrupt and was bought out by Hasbro. But the long and the short of it is that Hasbro now owned Monopoly. One of their very first acts was to exploit the continued popularity of their most famous product by arranging times with other brands and bands and celebrities and films and basically anyone that would have them. Boston Red Sox Monopoly? Yep. Frozen 2 Monopoly? You got it. Warhammer 40,000 Monopoly? I mean, it's just such Targeted a natural for collaboration. The it website the word Kill on it. lists a total of 1,400 <laughs> variants, but I've seen estimates as high as 7,000. In fact, in writing this video, I became briefly obsessed with trying to discover the weirdest Monopoly tie-ins. And among all of the Primark Monopolies and DPD Monopolies, the very worst I discovered was this. Monopoly Unite Students Edition. International viewers probably haven't heard of Unite Students, but they are, to quote the Times, Britain's biggest student land. That's right, you can sit in your student flat, the cost of renting which is about to go up by 5%, and roleplay as your own landlord. Or, as the back of the box puts it, invest in flats and blocks, then watch the rent come pouring in. Just please don't think too hard about where that rent comes from. If there is an afterlife, then Lizzie Maggie must be looking down or up or sideways in abject horror. 
The game she designed to educate people about how land ownership drives inequality transformed into a novelty, which encourages tenants to venerate their landlords. But is it really that simple? Or is there something we can salvage from the wreckage? Looking at the cultural positioning of Monopoly in the present day, it's easy to feel a sense of loss. And in many ways, this story is a tragedy. Slims down to its most basic elements, it's the story of an enigmatic and inventive woman whose creation was stolen from her. Worse still, the bastardised version of Lizzie Maggie's Landlord's Game that we know today is often viewed as a celebratory symbol of exactly the social injustices and inequalities which she hoped that it would invite people to critique. Modern Monopoly is even structured in such a way that makes Henry George's land value tax seem pretty stupid. See, as I explained earlier in the video, a land value tax is calculated based only on the value of a bare piece of land itself, without taking into account any buildings that have been built on the top of it. But in Monopoly, the value of empty lots of land is peanuts. Say you land on Illinois Avenue. That's Trafalgar Square if you're playing the UK version, or Ian Wright if you're playing this 2002 Arsenal edition, which I'm sure many of you are. If the owner of that square has built no houses, then you only owe them $20 in rent. But if you land on the same square and the player has built three houses on it, or coffee mugs if you're playing the Friends edition, then the rent will be a whopping $750. This suggests that the economic value of your stay in Illinois Avenue comes almost entirely from the houses rather than the mm. land on which they are. No crafting recipe for it. Of course, you could still be an absolute nerd and introduce a 100% land value tax to your game with Monopoly. But this would only result in the owner of Illinois Avenue, or Trafalgar Square, or Ian Wright, having to hand $20 of your rent over to the bank. The remaining $730 would still be theirs to do with as they please. And that's probably not going to make a huge dent in mm, the in-game welcome. That being said, I don't think all is lost. They look really Because, lame, yes, though. a lot has changed with regard to Monopoly since Lizzie Maggie first wrote that letter to the single tattoo a in the so. But the core mechanic is still the same. Those who are lucky enough to gobble Ooh. up on the land still end up with huge Life power over the land. And as players circle the board, the rich still get richer and the poor still get poorer. The contradiction of Monopoly, in which despite everyone owning at least one copy, everyone also kind of hates it, is not just a result of poor sportsmanship. It's the result of thoughtful, inventive game design. Lizzie Maggie's critique of landlordism wasn't just present in the surface level features of her game, it was baked into its actual mechanics. Which means that despite all attempts to rebrand Monopoly as a celebration of contemporary capitalism, Actually playing it leaves most people fizzing with rage. So maybe you will find yourself playing a game of Monopoly over the coming weeks. And maybe you will find yourself losing. And maybe you will find yourself limbering up in preparation to throw that board to the other side of the goddamn room. I hate this game. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But if you do, try to console yourself with the knowledge that what you may be losing you're also a learner. And isn't that the real victory? Yeah, no, I still really hate this. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that it has been worthy of your time. Uh, if you know anyone else you think also might uh, enjoy or get something out of this uh, intriguing tale of uh, betrayal, and uh, also maybe some hope, then uh, please do consider sharing it with them uh, in whatever manner you think is best to do so. Thank you as ever to the people who make this possible, my very top Patreon supporters, Richard, Alan Gann, Luke Meyer, 
Gary, Dipon Spain, Bill Mitchell, Al Spygart, Zetsi Reese, Alexander Blank, Neil to Build Guard, Sophia R, Sergio Suarez, Nicolas Jacquemart, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Elliot Day, Amit Singh Paraha, Mark Mead, Karen nice. Rose now, Gabriel Koch, Demelza, Jimmy Dunn, Christopher Cowan, and TK Loving for being signed up to that top tier of Patreon. Uh, if you would like to join them in getting early access to my videos, copies of the scripts to them, access to like directors, commentaries where I talk about the process of making each video uh, and more, then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Uh, yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. Once again, gaming crossovers, a concept that has absolutely exploded with popularity in recent years, taking two well-established franchises and mashing them together in order to market towards several communities and possibly get them interested in a new game. And it's so fun to see a game franchise come out and really find an audience and then see who the developer can convince to collab with them. Some of these collabs almost feel like jokes. Like there was a game that released in 1992 with a super fan account called Battle Soccer Field of Russia. But it wasn't any ordinary soccer game. It was a crossover of Godzilla, Gundam, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman. Alright, because it was an arcade <laughs> game.
Interplay Productions developed and published the series, so while they kept some of their original characters from previous play fighters and then came up with them before, they also brought some of the something to like over here. Ogreman and Earthworm Jim. Both were stars in two platformer games made on older consoles, and kind of appropriately, they also served as each other's rivals in the play fighter. But now let's talk about a game with a wild premise. The Japan only release for the GameCube, Dream Mix TV World Fighters. After the success of Super Smash Bros., streamer companies wanted to take a whack at their own crossover platform fighter, but this one is kind of weird. Konami, Hudson, and Takara. Wow, it's a sunken village. Like so cool. Yo, look at this. Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. And then June 2007 came along, 
and a new DS game was released, Itadaki Street DS, which brought together Dragon Quest and the Mario series. This was the second time Nintendo and Square Enix crossed over, following Mario Poops, and because this was released in 2007, it predates Slash and Sports Mix, making it the or first time ever that these. Mario and Dragon Quest collaborated. However, the series up to this point never Super left Japan, cool. but Nintendo, I guess, wanted to take a gamble because they took responsibility the so for cool, the but also so freaking dangerous. Imagine. So, for the first time ever, Itadaki Street left Japan, titled Fortune Street in the U.S. and Boom Street in PAL regions, and for many, this game was their Crap. first exposure to Dragon Quest, possibly getting them into the series, and that's what crossovers are all about. What are you doing? Why'd you carry a bucket of well, water that's literally worthless? It's better empty. <laughs> and you might know what game series I'm about to talk about. Mortal Kombat. Back in the day, Mortal Kombat was known as the game where you can rip a guy's head off. Nowadays though, Mortal Kombat is known as the game where you can rip a guy's head off as John Cena. There are just so many weird crossovers in this series. Mortal Kombat 9 featured Kratos exclusively on the PS3 and Freddy f Kruger as guest characters. But Mortal Kombat X really ramped oh, it up with a very efficient, huh? Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th, Leatherface from I Texas think Chainsaw Massacre, stolen and after that Alien and Predator. Mortal Kombat 11 generated a stone pillar after that generated in this guy's chips. Spawn, Terminator, Robocop, John Rambo, and the Joker. And now in the current yeah, entry, Mortal Kombat 1, we see a gory superhero thief with Omni Man from Invincible, Homelander from The Boys, and Peacemaker. The way this series has a huge roster of crossovers, you'd think it had always been this What way. the fuck? The really, had, the success of that <laughs> trend had everything to do with one really weird game. Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. Origin Valley. Yeah. Games, they made a bio that's just nostalgia. Bay. What the fuck? What mods added that? From both franchises, and it featured an actual story to play through, which was pretty uncommon at the time for a fighting game. While many sang the phrases of this Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I keep getting distracted. And pretty much right as Mortal Kombat also, this song is awesome. The it's the last music C8, C418 ever added. Because after this, any every new song from then on started becoming from coming from other producers instead. The first being C uh, Lena Rain's Pig Step for the Never Update. Which is also when all of the new guest characters started showing up. Not only that, but with the assets and experience in Netherrealm, WB could create a whole new fighting game series, Injustice, exclusively for the DC Comics characters. But then that game got some cool crossovers too. Ooh, the first like entry Lord. actually saw Mortal Kombat Scorpion, which makes sense. The water like levels rose at some point in Mortal time Kombat during DC. this world lifespan. The more Mortal Kombat characters, Raiden and Sub Zero. Yo, yeah, look at this, it looks exactly Ninja like Invader. Turtles. what the, really the fuck is that big Jungus looking thing? For crossovers, and they actually end up working. Another fighting game series with some kind of neat crossovers is Tekken, but it's definitely not to the level of Mortal Kombat. They only have five guest characters across the whole series. Golem the Dinosaur was added as a guest fighter all the way back in Tekken 3, thanks to the popularity this of his seat is actually wow. After a huge gap, Tekken 7 brought some more guests. Geese Howard from the Fatal Fury series and Noctis from Final Fantasy XV were revealed in the game's oh, first game of And while they're cool, they aren't too cool. They're both gaming characters. Anyway, this is actually pretty nice and flat. I can do my testing here. Dead in the game. Actually, this is just so, so random. I guess this me getting this track and working all that. TV show. It's just so out there. The base roster for Tekken 7 also featured Akuma from Street Fighter, but this isn't the first time Akuma has a Okay, they're called manga. This is definitely an Among Us joke. Oh my god. Why? Street Fighter Cross Tekken would feature a roster from This is amazing. play in the style of Street Fighter, while Tekken Cross Street Fighter would be a similar crossover, but using the Tekken game. It, it just such is. A cool it's idea. so amazing. It's the powerhouses of the fighting game genre, so seeing them cross over and create dual mirror games is just sick. And in 2012, I saw the release of the Street Fighter yeah, side I of the crossover, stronger which was met with a pretty lackluster reaction. The biggest concern with the game was the use of gems, which were paid items that could be equipped to your fighter to give them different attributes or abilities. This was pretty transparently a way to increase revenue for the game, which was apparently extraordinarily expensive. And worst yet, gems simply boiled down to a pay-to-win aspect of the game, which is super lame. 
It was also discovered that fully completed characters existed on the disc, but they weren't included as a part of the base roster and would instead be paid DLC, which definitely didn't help the sour taste that this game gave players. Despite that, the game moved forward with DLC, and it even had some pretty wacky ideas. Both companies implemented two of their classic non game characters. How do I, how do I deal and they with so their in sussiness? Such strange ways. For the Namco side, Pac Man guy was wasn't the imposter. A giant controllable mech to fight in. And for Capcom's choice, they went with Mega Man. But not just Mega Man, the horrendously ugly bad box art Mega Man that appeared on the North American box art for Mega Man 1. That's like something someone would mod into the game, but nope, it's the official character. Another fun DLC duo that got included is Toro the Sony Cat and his friend Kuro. Toro and Kuro basically served as mascots for Sony and the PlayStation at the time. Toro was dressed as and had the moveset of Ryu, while Kuro imitated Kazuya in his moveset. Oh, and just for good measure, they Let's threw in Cole McGrath from the Infamous series. And all of this DLC was exclusive to the PlayStation 3 and Vita versions of the game. The PC and the Xbox versions got nothing. There were negotiations for exclusive I just, characters on Xbox, but yeah, I could have just made a super flat this. world on. And Tekken Pro Street Fighter has never come out. The Tekken director, Katsuhiro Harada, said that development was halted in 2016, and the game was about 30% complete. An official reason has never really been given, though it's possible the failure of Street Fighter Cross Tekken played a big role in its cancellation. But they were actually able to reuse some of the assets when designing Akuma for his appearance in Tekken 7, so not all was lost, I guess. But when it comes to crossovers, there is one king that stands tall of the rest. Reef. Now, Capcom loves their crossover games. Street Fighter Cross Mega Man, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, Project Cross Zone, Marvel vs. Capcom. That's me! But they also love to license out their properties to other projects, especially Ryu. Super Smash Bros., Fortnite, Power Rangers, Minecraft, we love golf! Ryu and fucking and Fortnite, God! Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, an idea that Kevin Bacon appeared in so many films with enough high-profile actors that you can connect any actor back to Kevin Bacon in six moves or less. Well, the same thing has been done with Ryu. There are several accounts online that essentially link Ryu to different characters in the exact same way. Crash Bandicoot appeared alongside Bowser in Skylanders Imaginators, and Bowser and Ryu both appear in Smash for a Ryu number of two. Or there's Elmo from Sesame Street, who has appeared alongside Kermit the Frog. Kermit appears in Disney Heroes Battle Mode with Jack Skellington, and Jack Skellington is in Minecraft with Ryu for a Ryu number of three. You can even do it with real people. Tony Hawk appears alongside Spider-Man in Pro Skater 2, and Spider-Man and Ryu are in many of the Marvel and Capcom crossovers. But recently, you can actually play another fun game. How far away is any piece of media from Fortnite? This incredibly overstimulating chart really puts into perspective how impactful Fortnite has become. Your favorite franchise could only be three or four steps away from getting 90s cranked on it. With so many movies, TV shows, video games, real-life people appearing in the game, nothing can escape from Fortnite. And for that reason, you should use creator code ERINMAR in the Fortnite item shop. Crossovers are so cool. Bringing all these franchises together, linking you all of their out Mark too. you never know what you're gonna get. I mean, Ryu can even show up in this very video. <laughs> I make pixel arts. Making circles as squares is actually kind of second nature to me. Although pixel art doesn't being good, pixel art doesn't necessarily mean being good at building. Especially since Minecraft is 3D and pixel art is decidedly not. That's a good looking circle with a diameter of around 10, I believe. 
any larger and I will need to use some help. I only manually draw circles that are small since it's easier and faster for me to do it that way. Anyway. Building with a circle will definitely be hard. Penumbra. Is this the door from the wacky thing? The wacky biome? If so, I think it'll fit really nicely. A fucking gold door? It says it's redstone. But then again, no. Okay, interesting. Although fur is real nice as well, it's pretty common anyway. Oh, there's palm trees. I don't know any palms though, so I can't use that. Ah, here we go. The magic door. Ooh, this will gain. A dead door, lol. Alright, so I guess the number doesn't work. Okay. Maybe I should make the build a bit of piglin inspired thing. They can open fine enough. Hmm. I just polish the plate tile. Uh, it's very square. Mm. Uh, tiles work nice. I mean, they're called tiles after all, I guess. Nice room by own home hostile mob spawn whatsoever. So I can make a double door. But in reality, this Who is just an excuse to fuel my door. terrible obsession with this man's voice. The link to Ponzovink's analysis will be in the description. I'll be referring back to it at several points. 
From here on out, everything I say will be extremely pedantic and downright nonsensical. So keep in mind that I'm not trying to offer any groundbreaking insight or analysis here. I just like rambling about these characters. As voice actor PJ Hayward points out, William Afton's first ever spoken lines immediately make it clear what kind of person he is. That sequence was, uh, it was good writing because it was very, very clear that whatever question they were asking, William was not answering. So that gave you an insight into what, you know, what his character was like, even without knowing any of the backstory. You could see that William was, uh, on prime to not being fully honest at all. Yes, exactly. Due to his very peculiar choice of words, William's response almost feels disconnected from the rest of the conversation. The board member tells him, these are clearly state of the art. There are certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. To which William only acknowledges one in particular. She can dance, she can sing. Why did he do that? Is he stupid? From a writing perspective, this demonstrates William's disingenuous nature by essentially having him answer a different question than what was asked, thereby making him more suspicious. From a character perspective, William doesn't even perceive the board member as a threat to his scheme, and so he brushes the underlying accusation aside, pretending as if it wasn't even there. William tells the truth, Plus but not the full truth. Because he wants to believe that he can't be figured out, that he's just that Especially on a large scale As the man who designed these robots, he would know about the Actually, they work fine on large scale buildings. The smaller the scale, which is simply this what I'm going for, my power isn't going to be that big. Just through the script alone, Tiles we learn that William really, is a duplicitous really and egotistical person. Not only does he ignore the accusatory nature of the question he's asked, but he uses it as an opportunity to continue showing off his technical achievements. So, how is this all enhanced by the voice acting? We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. She can dance. She can sing. She's my friend. FNAF's radio drama-esque approach to dialogue means that, in many cases, the voice is the only way through which a character can be perceived. And as a result, the personalities of these characters are often able to be interpreted just from their voice alone. I should be dead, but I'm not. As if what he had already done wasn't enough. Whoops, that's gonna leave a mark. Through applying this approach to William Afton, a character whose on-screen actions have already established him as the overarching villain of FNAF and the personification of evil and deceit, his voice becomes one of the most windows? iconic in the entire series well. because it too has to embody to, each of those concepts. I and I want to clarify, none of the qualities of William's voice ended up in the games by mistake. They were all evaluated and then intentionally approved by Scott, as pedantic as my observations may be. We know that Scott's direction with his voice actors is very precise. Scott has a very precise understanding of exactly what he wants in the performance and what he wanted for this character. And it says a lot about Afton, that this is the final voice he ended up with. His voice is resonant, bassy, a quality that creates the image of a man of authority, someone you listen to carefully and unquestioningly. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. It reinforces the idea that Although he is essentially lying, he's fully confident in himself and his ability to conceal the truth. William's voice is obviously supposed to be untrustworthy. Everyone, including the voice actor himself, thinks so. I'm just, I'm just wondering who heard that voice and thought, well, he sounds like an upstanding citizen. <laughs> but what gives us that impression, aside from just the subtext of the word? For one, there's his subtle growl, reminiscent of voices like Jeremy Irons' Scar or Tony Todd's Candyman. Oh, surely that lions, black man. You'll therefore be a tale to frighten children, to make lovers cling closer in their rapture. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. Which alone would be pretty telling of his character, but layered on top of it, is an overly gentle line reading. She can sing. In Afton's attempt to sound friendly, he inadvertently sounds like he's holding back a ton of aggression, like a minimum wage store assistant helping you out while simultaneously trying to blow you up with their mind. Another element of this sequence that puts Afton as an intimidating figure is the brief, but still very palpable, beat between the board member's turn speaking and his. We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. She can 
dance. She can sing. What happened to it this time? Just seems like these things can't go a day without breaking down. Who knows? It's always the same man. The silence between them lasts only about a second, but it feels a lot longer, as you're forced to stare at the motionless, shadowy engulfed circus baby, and listen to that indiscernible ambience, waiting for someone to just say something. This prolonged lack of response from William could mean anything, just as much as it could mean nothing. Was he caught off guard by the board member calling him out? Was he hesitating to say something else? What physically was he doing at that moment? It's impossible to know, because we can't see him, and for a brief moment, we couldn't hear him, and thus, we couldn't read him. You might even doubt for that short second that there would be any response. Even just the lack of dialogue establishes him as someone who has something to hide. And, and of course, there's a British accent, because British usually means e e British usually means evil. <laughs> The analysis from Pons of Ink, which I mentioned earlier, made clever use of a device which they dubbed the I can hear the smile in his voice scoreboard. Sometimes in a voice actor's performance, I you can that they use the crap and mossy versions as well, but especially when they're smiling, you can hear it. You in know, voice. Another, Yuri, another I, of course, this does the Yuri I Guild is a. I don't know if you know this, but the Yuri I Guild consists. Pretty much entirely of women, and uh, not to be sexist or anything, but women typically like their things to look nice, clean, and uniform. You know? Uh, this is the wrong... If I decided to start adding in some crap variants here and there, it would admittedly look nice, but one, that would be harder for me to do, and two, I'm fucking sexist. What can I make from these? I believe these should work like logs. They don't have a vertical, they don't have a horizontal version. I have a roof thingy, but not... That kinda sucks. Corner terms are interesting. They work like stairs in terms of how you can place them. But again, they don't have any tiling. I don't know what how I can use these either. The trims though were super nice. I was thinking I could just use columns for pillars, but they honestly kind of suck. Here are actual pillars. Again, for the interior, 
but why would I bother with making these when I can just do this? Look at this, it's so nice. The shape looks circular. It has depth. Apply to every voice performance ever, but it's definitely something that applies to William Afton. Which again, comes in handy for deciphering the emotion behind his dialogue due to him not physically being visible as he talks. So while not all of William's lines will be spoken with an audible smile, this observation still made me think more carefully about what face it sounds like he's making in general. Nice. All this to say, you can hear the smirk on William's face. I'm not seems. sure if I will be adding <laughs> colors <laughs> on the interior <laughs> though, but right we'll things. see. It extends the dialogue with an aura of smugness, and more notably, pride. Notice how he over-enunciates each of the features, and how this makes the smile in his voice more prominent. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with built-in helium tech. She can take song requests. There's a clear enthusiasm behind his words, suggesting that he is genuinely proud of this design, and perhaps to an extent, bragging about it. The predominantly low tones of this speech give a nonchalant, yeah, it's no big deal, tone to the delivery, which makes it subtly condescending, especially that last part. She could even dispense ice cream. It's spoken as if William was expecting a round of applause to follow, like it's the most impressive thing ever conceived. Bottom line is, William really embraces the salesman part of his snake oil salesman nature here. It sounds like the slowest, most gun to the viewer's head infomercial. Speaking of, let's quickly go over the direction that Scott gave Afton's voice actor to influence his performance. Yes, I'm aware this is like the tenth time I'm bringing it up on this channel, but now it's actually relevant, and not just some cool trivia. In Scott's method of summing up the essence of his characters for the voice actors, he described William Afton as a snake oil salesman. The original audition said that he was looking for somebody who looked like a snake oil salesman. Which essentially means a con artist. Someone who puts on an act in order to gain your trust. PJ Hayward summarized the voice that Scott was after as the calm sociopath. What would be the signature color for Yuri? The calm sociopath. And it was that essence of William Afton's character which reminded PJ of the character Hannibal Lecter, known best as his yeah, might be a good choice. in the Silence of the Lambs. PJ particularly took inspiration from Yuri's or Lily's Lily flowers in the silence of the are lambs white, is seen in but the center thingy, the bud thing. And to me, it's that, colored yellow. Uh, put me in mind of the bell thing. The characteristics uh, of the character was well, that. And black is, well, it's not white. Well, you know, even if he was uh, during someone at the time. Ready when you are, Sergeant Pepper. He has a slow, careful way of talking, and is generally very hard to read. You're very frank, Harry. I think it would be quite something to know you in private life. Could go with a design like this for every carpet I decide to add if I am going to use carpets. Much like how we hear Afton speak with a smile, the inspiration for his voice does so as well. Quite often, another trait the two characters share it's like a is castle. the air of elegance and sophistication with which they speak. It's this is a power. Lecter is almost always meant to resemble a dungeon. His it's not an actor, Yuri eyes, it's very familiar. Years. With Afton, however, and in fact, quite at home in dungeons. His true self is far more erratic. That's why I wanted to go on. with that for my design. In Fnatic, Scrap Shop's voice is a drastic change from the last time we heard Afton. PJ definitely turned up the Candyman dial on his performance. Be my victim. What a deceptive calling! But he is still clearly the same character. Afton's voice here isn't that of your typical zombie because he's very much the same person he was before he died. He hasn't lost any sense of who he is. If anything, he's embracing his true self now more than he ever had. But despite that, his death still took a toll on his body. Duh. And his voice is now more gravelly, sickly, and monstrous. An indication of how far from human he has become in every possible way. Fascinating. What they have become. It genuinely sounds painful for him to talk yet he persists with his theatrics anyway, very much reflecting his attitude towards his reanimation as a whole. What should have been a punishment for him, he's turned into empowerment, and ironically, he is more full of life after having died. 
What a deceptive calling. I knew it was a lie the moment I heard it, obviously. But it is intriguing nonetheless. After successfully salvaging each of the animatronics, they will passively threaten you. Discounting Lefty for obvious reasons. They make it clear that getting into the pizzeria is exactly what they want, and that you're making a big mistake by letting them in. With Afton, he barely makes an attempt to sound in control. He basically yes. admits that he got tricked into coming here and says, Oh, yeah, but I totally knew it was a lie. He makes it sound like he knows this is all a trap, and the only reason he fell for it was to see what would happen. And yes, that's a very cool thing to say in the face of a trap, but he doesn't really do anything about it. He still gets burnt at the end. I mean, there's no way he knew that was going to happen too, right? <laughs> right? right? This... this wasn't all part of his plan, was it? Oh, God! But no, Afton is very clearly egotistical, and the fact that he's less interested in the player at this moment, and more in defending his intelligence, is proof of that. I'm so glad this comment was in the analysis, by the way. I noticed the same thing, and I thought it was crazy, because I've never seen anyone else mention it. Even now, I can't tell if this is an editing flub or not. I don't hear any abrupt cuts, it just feels weirdly fast at all. But again, the performance that Scott demands out of his actors is very precise and deliberate, which is reinforced by the fact that PJ Haywood sends multiple takes for each of his lines whenever he works with Scott. This is further supported by the internal names of PJ's audio in the game files. That speech at the end of System Location Custom Night, that was interesting from the perspective of just trying to get it right for Scott, and I think I actually did several takes on that. The toughest part was the Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator was doing the uh, Spring Trap voice. I ended up doing about four takes for every line just to give Scott plenty of options to make sure that he could get what he wanted, and, and Scott was great. He was like, no, don't worry, you're, you're totally nailing it, it's fine. So that's also something to keep in mind when our line delivery sticks out, is that ultimately, Scott chose this one over all of the others. What the delivery of this take could mean, however, I think I agree with Ponce of Inc. Afton is trying to convince himself that what he's saying is true. This seems implied by the manner in which he kind of interrupts himself, making it seem as though he's tacking on extra details as he thinks them up in the moment. I knew it was a lie the moment I heard it, obviously. An intense venom permeates this line reading. Afton is mad. The scornful eye roll behind the delivery of deceptive, deceptive, as well as how he stresses the word obviously, obviously, tells us that although he says he knew it was a lie from the beginning, he mm -hmm. might have been All holding out for a little longer than he cares to admit. And upon confirming his suspicions, he is very much annoyed. Equally communicated by the delivery of these words is how much Afton despises being lied to. He perhaps even takes offense to just the idea that someone thinks oh, that for him. He rasps the word doors and stuff won't come until next update. I knew it was there are doors and stuff in the grave mod that I can't children. get it to work it's properly, so I just got rid of it. So. Okay. Hopper is just kind of an underwhelming block to work with right now. Airs, his delivery elucidates that it's not worth using in my opinion. So I'm not using it. As his thoughtful smile towards the end of the line grants us another point on the scoreboard. Which I completely stole. Sorry, Ponsovic. But it is intriguing nonetheless. The lines in which Afton's snake hiss are present seem to vary, but strangely, what I found in common with these lines is that they both reference the calling which Lord Afton hear. Based on this, I think this quirk might just be something Afton does when he's deep in thought. I can perfectly picture him stroking his chin when he speaks like that. Though it could very well just be a coincidence, as this trait in Afton's speech isn't unique to the S sounds. He hangs on to other sounds in his dialogue as well. It's kind of the distinctive feature of this incarnation of him, where he drags words out longer than they need to be. It's especially noticeable in his more breathy line readings. How can I resist a promise such as this? Afton often seems very distant, as if he's never actually talking directly to someone, more like he's always thinking aloud, which I think has been an effect seen in all of his lines so far, and will be for most of them. But especially this one, as it has more of an air of self-evaluation than any kind of jeer, cheer, taunt, as if he's actually acknowledging his own weakness, admitting that, yes, I couldn't resist, sue me. Even places heavy emphasis on resist, treating the idea of him ignoring this promise as incredulous. 
How can I resist? Afton has already established that he knows he was called into a trap. So, what was promised to him that he hasn't already dismissed? Maybe he figured out what Henry's plan is, and he's morbidly curious to see it all play out. Though, that would imply that he either wants to die, which I don't believe for a second, or that he thinks he'll be totally fine in the I end. I think I'll just go with Blash. But seriously, this is a valid explanation, I think. That he's just so arrogant, he genuinely doesn't believe he's in any danger. His audible, smug grin, and his almost playful sibilance make this line reading overall very cocky. A promise such as this. With the way he talks, it's impossible that Afton doesn't have at least some idea what's going to happen here, and he probably believes that he can just sit back and watch it all go down. Consider the context that Afton has almost been killed at least twice at this point in the story, and has survived to tell the tale both of those times. It's not a stretch to assume. Nice. That nice. Much like a swordsman after a duel dying one month after the fact. Death from diseases thanks to injuries are a common way to go back in those days. And has thus thrown all caution to the wind. Unlike the other animatronics, Afton is aware Quartz enough is to nice, but I hate white. Henry lied to him. But despite that knowledge, he sticks around with his fellow aimless amalgamations anyway. Not at all worried about what's going to happen to him, just curious. He no longer cares about the danger of an obvious trap. Because as far as he's concerned, he always comes back. Why should anything worry him? I always come back. Of course, this line originates from the trailer for FNAF 3. He will come back, he always does. The title card that follows is often forgotten, however. We have a place for him. Whether referring to the spring bonnie suit or the safe room, either way, Afton would become trapped and slowly rot inside both of them. It is then no wonder that the final part of this muncher would become dissociated from the rest. Especially here, when it's coming from Afton himself. The implication that anyone could have any power over him is completely removed, so that he can basically reclaim this quote. This is one of many instances where Afton's arrogance is on full display. You'll notice the heavy emphasis on always. I always come back. It's as if he's correcting you, or scolding you, for neglecting to remember that he does always come back. This line reading is just full of energy, and with the context that this line is spoken after Afton kills the player, it's an easy connection to make that Afton is relishing his moment of triumph. Oh. Like he's just confirmed and proven to himself that after all this time, he's still got it. Bittersweet, but fitting. The overall reading for this death quote is very reserved, bordering on somber, giving the impression that Afton doesn't want to dwell on how this kill makes him feel. The smirk you can hear at the end of the line could be read as Afton rejecting this creeping sentimentality. Essentially going, well, that was emotionally conflicting, let's move on. Because while that smirk is present, the end of the line is also spoken through a sigh. But fitting. If this is the case, there's a very Schrodinger's cat situation going on with Afton's attitude towards killing here. In one universe, he may be thrilled by it. In another, he broods over it. The interpretation that Ponza Fink suggests is pretty solid. That Afton isn't too fond of killing this particular person. This line read overall lacks the enthusiasm that is heard in the majority of Afton's lines, even the quieter ones, which might have to do with who exactly he just killed. He finds this triumph bittersweet, not just bitter or just sweet. He believes it makes sense for this confrontation to end in his victory, but it still leaves him unsatisfied. Here's what I think it boils down to. Afton appreciates poeticism, or narrative symmetry, if you prefer. When he flips a phrase that was meant to condemn him into his own self-aggrandizing slope, that's fitting. When the atrocity that is murder brings him closer to the blessing that is eternal life, that's fitting. When he kills his own son after indirectly killing the rest of his children, that's fitting. Their deaths were freak accidents, 
and there was no blood on his hands. But this time around, the death of his last child, the one who was arguably the most subservient and helpful to him, is conscious and hands-on. Uncomfortable as it is for Afton, he can't help but acknowledge how fitting it is that he achieved this victory through killing his only remaining child. But hey, that's just a theory. A game! Fascinating. What they have become. As if this line wasn't chilling enough in written form, it also provides perhaps the most obvious point on the smile scoreboard. One which is in the same ballpark as the other smiles, where they're either sinister or just after not a power trip. Here, he's genuinely impressed, almost excited. His pensive delivery is especially prominent here, with how the ends of his words are drawn out. His tone is possibly the most gentle of all of his lines in this game. Fascinating. What they have become. It is this line out of all of William's dialogue across all of the games that I think reveals most explicitly where his core values lie, and just how deep his malevolence runs. He's a man of science at heart. He's deeply curious, and that principle overrides any sliver of morality that could possibly exist within him. The they here, of course, refers to the spirits of the children, whose deaths William is responsible for. Ah, Literally every antagonist in this game is someone William has killed. Um, and settling they for a regular glass. deformed metal monsters, cursed to move and act without agency. The fact that William can talk about this so casually, and not to mention proudly, especially compared to the grief and regret we hear Henry display elsewhere in the game, tells us that he is so morally bankrupt and selfish that he can only see these small souls stuck in limbo as not just his personal experiments, but his achievements. These are the words and tone of voice we'd hear from a biologist watching bacteria float around in a petri dish, now being associated with the souls of children, forced to persist after death. Afton notably doesn't claim responsibility over this outcome. It's not what I have turned him into, it's what they have become. Making it feel like, in some twisted way, he's admiring what these children have grown up to become, like a parental figure. It's simultaneously dehumanizing and creepily familiar. All of this perfectly summarizes Afton's true motivation as a villain. His curious scientific mind blending with his fascination of the spiritual. But hey! That was easier than I thought it would be. This death quote feels weirdly morose. As Ponzevin points out, there is no smile anywhere in this line reading in any capacity, despite the inherently boastful language Afton uses. It's clear that Afton got no enjoyment from killing the player here, and I don't think it's as simple as just he wanted there to be more of a challenge. Though I'm also not denying that being true. Afton is very much a sadist and enjoys the hunt, but he usually relishes his kills a little more. Notice how he essentially stumbles his way through the latter half of this sentence, skipping over that he normally pronounced very carefully, like it's suddenly too much effort for him. Easier than I thought it would be. It even kind of sounds like his voice breaks with the last couple of words, and plus the way he seems to force out the word easier. That was easier. It all signifies that he's struggling to keep up this overconfident facade, and that he doesn't necessarily want to admit that this victory was easy. We already gathered from a previous voice line that William isn't 100% fond of killing Michael, so is this him trying to repress his remorse by spouting more show-off quips? For someone who doesn't like being lied to, he sure struggles with being honest himself. What at first looks like empty belittlement is revealed to be genuine disappointment, showcasing very rare vulnerability from Afton. And perhaps this was just a creative choice to rub salt in the wound of the player who just finished their second to last task of the night before getting jump scared. But I think it's just as likely that this was for the sake of clarifying the relationship between William and Michael, as other lines do for the other animatronics. And as does this next line. Well, wow, look how long I've been recording. I spent the entirety of this kind of trade in mode, huh? It's still me. While this could be a meta line for the player, referencing the fact that his suit is now suddenly inexplicably different from the last time we saw him, this line also establishes a history between William and our player character, suggesting that we've seen it before, just not like this. 
It also highlights a point I made earlier, that Afton is more himself in this suit than he was outfit. No matter how little he resembles his human self, he's still the same person he always was. Again, he hasn't lost any sense of who he is, and the monster he's become on the outside is what he always was on the inside. It's also very slimy of Afton to say something that sounds so reassuring, while simultaneously trying to kill the person he's directing it at. It's kind of reminiscent of the way that he tries to comfort his victims as he kills them in the books. There's also the very striking smile in this line, which stands out because it's not just a smile, it's unmistakably laughter. Afton is chuckling. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, that's still me. He could be giggling to himself over the prospect of lulling yet another victim into a false sense of security. Or, hear me out, he considers this a sort of father-son bonding moment. His laughter is the subtle kind that you would weave into your words when you're joking around with friends, telling a funny story, or maybe pointing out to a family member that you haven't seen in ages how much you've changed over the years. <laughs> I bet you didn't even recognize me. It's so subtle that it comes across as cordial, something that you go out of your way to do so that your listener doesn't feel uncomfortable. Afton is acknowledging his drastic transformation, but in a very light-hearted way. Whether he has a genuine soft spot for Michael, or is simply trying to manipulate him and get him to lower his guard, one thinks for certain he's I'm making an effort to at least sound like look. a normal I think, I think a circle look is a fine Way enough look I see complaints for the exterior, honestly. The lines of, a circle in Minecraft like are already pretty... He's too cartoony. Epic. However, these are not problems with it's his like voice. Afton's one of those things that you think should not be possible, dialogue, and therefore you know will be hard to achieve, the, the fact that they can anything, be achieved. It's the writing that should be critiqued here, you know. Plus, I will be putting forms and stuff so that should hopefully offset the bare emptiness. Hopefully. Ultimately, I'm still not really a ghost. Where FNAF 6 Afton is defined by his whispered menace, Special Delivery Afton is distinguished by his uh. For now, like all who have stood before me. Granted, every animatronic is made more quippy in this game, but given the last time we heard unique dialogue, how did you get Afton, all the way he was over just here? A little more eloquent and deliberate with his words. It's kind of a surprise to now see him showing off a more I'm tired. energetic manic I think I'm gonna end things here. Much of prior. I'm not fully aware of the writing process behind the voice lines in Special Delivery, but PJ Haywood has attributed the writing credit to Illumix, the developers of the game, as opposed to Scott Cawthon, the creator and writer for most of the series. Additionally, a distinct quality of some of the voice lines in this game, including Springtraps, is that they have multiple variants, different takes for the same line, which are all used in-game. I bet you didn't expect me to show up. Did you now? I bet you didn't expect me to show up. Did you now? One of Springtrap's lines even has four variants. It is not your flesh that sustains me. It is your fear. It is not your flesh that sustains me. It is your fear. It perhaps hammers in that there's no real significance to these lines, as there was no one perfect take that nailed one specific emotion the director wanted to convey. Some of them are just straight up too generic to glean anything from. At the very least, PJ Haywood manages yeah, to make every line sound guy. badass, regardless of how plain they might be. Your time is up. But all that in mind, who knows just how canon these lines and what they suggest about after I'm, I'm going to talk the about them because it's fun. But before that, <laughs> there's one more voice to William after an appearance that we can't forget about. I think Springtrap in the FNAF AR trailer is a perfect balance between his FNAF 6 and Special Delivery incarnations. He's less guttural, but still hushed in his tone, as if only half trying to sound reassuring. Springtrap's lines in this trailer were the first time we got to see his habit of stealing other characters' lines. If you don't count, I always come back, which is kind of a grey area since that's not a line that seems to exist within the diegesis of FNAF before Afton himself says it. His first line is this. I'm, gonna go find a I'm not sure if it's the seemingly random addition of the in this line, or just the way it's delivered, maybe a mix of both, but the effect of this line differs from Michael's rendition, as the act is made to sound more deliberate, calculated, devious. Springtrap makes the conscious decision to lurk in the shadows. 
because it gives the impression that he could be hiding anywhere, ready to spring out at any time. <laughs> Whereas Michael lives in the shadows out of necessity, because he's been forced to find a way to adapt to his new undead life. The difference between them is that Springtrap makes the most out of his reanimation, and uses the shadows not as refuge, but almost as cover as he prepares to ambush his prey. I'm watching you. This delivery is noticeably matter-of-fact, and also the loudest that Springtrap gets in the trailer. This, as well as the next line, have a very trying-to-get-into-your-head feeling about them, which plays into Afton's characterization as manipulative, and establishes how he seems to be toying with the listener. It's real. It's happening. I'm a big fan of the echo behind this line. Combined with the whisper, it almost blends into the background noise, and makes you question for a second whether you actually just heard that or not. It's panic-inducing. Fear-inducing, even. This was the only line in which I could make out any sort of smile at the tail end of the sentence, and being Springtrap's final line in the trailer, I find this rather fitting, as it seems to tell us that he's letting this super serious act slip, revealing that he was just toying with you, the listener, this whole time, letting your fear rise, and having fun as he did so. Overall, his lines here have a more stern reading to them, at times even sounding urgent, like he's trying to warn you of something. But that ultimately underpins Springtrap's true motivation, which is to draw out your fear. This segues nicely into the lines that actually appear in Special Delivery, starting with this one. It is not your flesh that sustains me, it is your fear. Another display of Afton's sadism, he actually goes out of his way to clarify to the player that he's not a mindless murderer, that he isn't even in it for the kill, he's in it for the thrill of the hunt. He ensures that his victim suffers as much as possible, and his final blow to achieve that is to let you know that he didn't even need to kill you, smiling as he says so in one variant. It is your fear. For the most part, the different takes of Springtrap's lines feature both a vitriolic, intensely aggressive reading and a more reserved, passively threatening reading, which reflects Afton's two-faced nature as a calm, elegant performer and an erratic, short-tempered egotist. The jeers from the other animatronics all have some thematic relevance to their character. Baby's threats involve ice cream, Foxy's involve generic pirate shenanigans, and Springtrap's threats almost all involve fear. This includes the aforementioned line, as well as these. Your fear will consume you. I can taste the fear in your breath. You will fear me. See if fear still sounds like a real word by the end of all this. Jesus. Fear is the motif that was chosen to be associated with an incarnation of William Afton, and how he threatens the player, no less. It's something that he specifically specializes in, that the others apparently don't. To Afton, it seems that the feeling of being afraid is the pinnacle of suffering. I think that what we're supposed to take away from it being something he talks incessantly about is that he knows what fear does to a person. Even the way he says the word is reminiscent of how he says lie in FNAF 6, where he evidently hates the feeling of the word fear in his mouth. The concept is just that repugnant to him. I can taste the fear in your breath. It is not your flesh that sustains me. It is your fear. Additionally, his talk of fear doesn't always sound like he's trying to intimidate the player, but genuinely warn them. Listen to how angry and almost desperate this line reading comes across. Your fear will consume you. Fear is a feeling that Afton knows all too well, and though he still feeds off of it, that doesn't erase the far from fond memories he associates it with. Springtrap actually references the missing children incident a few times, but in a peculiar, even kind of funny way. The way he wow. talks about them, you really? think his previous victims were like his lifelong adversaries or something. People who, in his eyes, had it coming because they dared to oppose him or something and not literal children. Hide if you want. It did not save the others. It will not save you. I will make you suffer. Suffer like so many of the others. Suffer now, like all who have stood before me. Is this simply more of Afton's egotism? Trying to convince the player, and perhaps even himself, that his previous killings were more impressive than they actually were? I feel that that would actually make some sense as we know that Afton considers the monsters his victims have become to be major scientific advancements. 
And so, maybe he glorifies the memory of the day he killed them, looking back on the event with rose-tinted glasses. What muddies this is the glaring lack of a smile in the multiple variants of these lines. If anything, Springtrap speaks with a burning anger. It will not save you. Which actually appears to rise when he mentions the others. I will make you suffer. Suffer like so many of the others. Instead of I smiling, it's more like he's arrow. gnashing his teeth. And while I thought it was weird that he would have disdain for the children who he was never shown to have killed out of any personal vendetta, they did do this to him, to be fair. <laughs> so I guess now we have some idea how he feels about that. I'd like to draw a comparison between the two voice lines where Springtrap laughs. First of all, I love them both. But they carry entirely different undertones. Got you! <laughs> One suggests genuine amusement, while the other sounds pained and forced. Which you could argue was a mistake on DJ Hayward's part, because laughing while maintaining the Springtrap voice is hard. But I'm going to argue against that. The more jovial laughter is paired with this line. Got you! Even while he says those words, you can hear a light chuckle. He's having so much fun. Which is exactly why I think this triumphant laugh comes out so naturally for him. However, his undead state and the constant pain caused by the suit makes it hard for him to laugh for the sake of performance and intimidation. Which is the vibe I get from this laughter. <laughs> diamond for bounty boards and that's why it sounds if they worse, aren't naturally spawning. Afton just can't bring himself to drop his theatrical persona. I get the same vibe from this line. It is time. Due to the unnatural rhythm giving the impression that he's exerting himself. Despite the pain, Afton seems to have a very the show must go on attitude towards this unshakable, in control persona he puts on. The got you line also reads as very infantilizing, due to how almost lighthearted it's delivered, like a parent playing with their child. It's a further example of the strange way that Afton likes to bond with his victims. <sighs> Much like how he stole Michael's lines in the trailer, in the actual game, Springtrap blatantly plagiarized three of his voice lines from Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear in New Zealand. You will not be spared. You will not be saved. is sort of a portmanteau of two Nightmare Fredbear lines. You must see how many times she can be pulled apart. Let me put you back together and shake you apart all over again. But it's still very much plagiarism and grounds for detention. What? Given that UCN was very likely William Afton's personal hellish torment, it seems that this incarnation of him, being so full of himself to be back in action again, intentionally took the mocking, diminishing words of his tormentors and began using them against his own victims to spite the animatronics that tortured him for so long. The way that Springtrap reverses the order of the actions described by Nightmare Fredbear complements Afton's inquisitive mindset, especially concerning death. Where Fredbear makes it sound like what it is, plain old torture, Afton makes it sound like an experiment. And indeed, this is a subject that he has historically shown a curiosity towards. I'm not sure if there is a smile here or not. It's very subtle if so. But what really makes oh, this one stand out is how slow there, there's a zombie girl in the really also stronger relishing by this default. Of being back. I don't really care about AR Springtrap being a digital replica. You got 30 hit points. This is cool, let me have this. God, I think they're after fast. Taking a quick breath between his words and sighs the word back as if he was hesitant to believe it for a fleeting moment, but ultimately accepts and takes relief in confirming that he is indeed back. There are surprisingly more vulnerable moments of Afton than I thought there were. I suppose he really is fueled by fear. Out of the 150 actors who auditioned for the role of William Afton, there are two whose auditions we've actually heard, Kellen Goff and PJ Haywood. I just, I just replied to an audition uh, question and 
uh, there, I think there were over 150 other people who responded to it, so uh -huh. I was quite surprised. I, I understand Kellen actually responded to it as well. Uh -huh. so. Really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I saw a stream uh -huh. with him and uh, Matt Pat, because he was actually uh -huh. playing his audition, which sounded very different to mine. So this is your audition for William? Yeah, this is my audition for William. All right, let's do it. I feel there are elements of this design that perhaps you don't fully understand. How about the uh, was audition line? Okay. Which was, with some features of these robots that you don't fully understand. In Goff's rendition, you pick up on arrogance and vanity. And Hayward's version contains much the same ego, but it is notably underlined with condescension. With Goff's Afton, you can almost hear him steepling his fingers while having an inner monologue about how intelligent he is. Excellent! With Haywood's Afton, there's an unspoken backhanded pity. He's not only praising himself, he's belittling you, the listener. It's like how an adult would talk down to a child. Although Haywood's rendition is only from memory and delivered impromptu during an interview, I'd still consider it a demonstration of his understanding of this character. Afton puts himself on a pedestal and he makes sure to look down on everyone from that pedestal. In PJ's Reddit AMA, conducted after sister location, but before FNAF 6, he states that William is a bad guy with mysterious motivations, and is clearly sly, manipulative, and deceptive. All of which is communicated very clearly through all of his dialogue, although his mysterious motivations are fleshed out a lot more in his following outing in FNAF 6. In his interview with Dorco, which was conducted after he voiced in FNAF 6, but before he voiced in Special Delivery, he suggests that the unhinged boastfulness of Soldozer, who he also voiced, contrasts with his understanding of William Afton. I wasn't fully appreciated in my last outing, but now I'm back to show you my full power. Basically, it's the sociopath. The calm sociopath. You did, um, uh, Soldozer in, um, FNAF World as well. Yes. I didn't think about that. No, that's fine. Um, Soldozer is actually clearly someone who's, uh, you know, boastful and has no restraint whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, different. <laughs> it's, it's... And yet Springtrap's unrestrained anger and boastfulness in the later special delivery would go on to rival Soldozer's. This just goes to show that there is always more to learn about a character, and the ways that we, or even their actors currently perceive them, can always be challenged or developed by future appearances. William's character has always remained the same. We've just been shown more and more small glimpses of it throughout the games, in the same way that we've only had small snippets of the whole Five Nights at Freddy's story with each of the games. So, now that we've seen all of these individual glimpses into William Afton's personality, can we say definitively who he is? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to answer who I think he is. William Afton's depravity runs deep, but so does his cowardice. He lives his life subservient to his fear of death, and he lets it shape his attitude towards practically everything. He is theatrical, performative, and loves to put on a sophisticated, somewhat stoic persona. Moreover, he seems to treat the world like some sort of stage play, finding appreciation in those narratively satisfying moments, especially the ones that end in his favour. He's a total egotist, and will hold himself to a much higher regard than those around him. Unabashedly, he will let you know that you're inferior to him. He has a deeply curious mind, and is always looking to learn more, especially regarding the spiritual and the scientific, foregoing morals and ethics in pursuit of knowledge. The only humanity left in him seems to only reveal itself when his children are concerned, as he apparently shows genuine concern for them. Maybe, deep down, he still cares for them, but perhaps more likely, the act of the caring parent and having people perceive him that way is just another conduit through which he fuels his ego. He only goes through the motions of an average father without any of the commitment. He sends Michael to circus babies in his stead, takes only the bare minimum precautions to keep Elizabeth safe, and uses the crying child's death to further his research. His children are tools to him, which is where the illusion of parental concern comes from. So, this man is a theatrical, egocentric, manipulative, and all-in-all all, soulless facsimile of a human being. But make no mistake, he is far from one-dimensional in his evil. His voice makes it clear that he's one of the most layered characters in all of FNAF. It conveys strengths and weaknesses, confidence and insecurity, and 
that no matter how much he wants to be so much more, in the end, he's just another human. Uh, but he, he's also a total genius, not to mention a badass. Uh, his voice is just so cool. Big thanks and shout out to Ponza Vink on Tumblr.com. Please go check them out if you're into spooky stuff and also scrap trap. Thank you for inspiring me to make this video with your own beautifully pedantic analysis and for allowing me to steal pretty much all of your observations from there. I'm sorry if I didn't add that much onto them. I also appreciate your blog for allowing me to indulge more in talk about my favorite FNAF voice actor. For that, you are very cool. You get me. You get me. If I haven't made it clear enough already, I love William Afton. And a significant factor in my love for him is the way that he talks. His voice is very important to me. So getting to break it down to this extent was very cathartic. I think that too often we just accept FNAF's voice lines at the surface level. That's just cool words that the characters say with a cool voice. But when you really pay attention to how the voice and the words are played with, and you listen to these lines over and over, the subtle, careful touches to the acting will show themselves. Okay, maybe that's easy for me to say because I already like listening to them. But really, it's like listening to this dialogue. Hey, so this is the comprehensive review of Ocarina of Time without any nostalgia. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good.
from camera. Okay, wow, this is taking a while. Consider subscribing. Without further ado, let's get started. This is a mod called Effortless Building, which adds a bunch of different building tools that really do make building effortless. And the best part is that it works not only in creative mode, but it even works in survival mode. How crazy is that? For example, it even adds a couple of different items that give you different building tools in survival mode, like this leather randomizer bag, which as you can see, has its own inventory, which represents various different blocks that I want to build with. And as you can imagine,